Welcome everybody to today's PayVinR session. The topic will be Introduction to PCC Mixed Design. And I would like to congratulate all of you for making it to this PayVinR. I was relaxing, reading a little Tuesday morning quarterback on ESPN.com when I started getting the phone calls and the emails saying that the website was down. <laughs> because when I booted my computer up, the, uh, the website was working. Uh, about 11.30, but it has since gone down, and then it was back up, and then it's back down again. So I sent out kind of an emergency email that some of you have already responded to, and thank you for that. Um, but please do uh, send me an email or respond to my email, as noted in the chat box, if you're interested in a PDH certificate, because the the way I get your email is through you logging in through the website. And since a lot of you have not been able to log on through the website, um, I want to make sure that everyone gets their, their PDH. So I apologize for the uh, technical snafu, but I guess that's, that's part of the beauty of technology is the, the double-edged sword. So again, thank you for participating. And we will be talking about Introduction to PCC Mixed Design today. So some logistics of Pavinars. If you can't hear me talking right now, I encourage you to check your computer value, volume and or speakers on your personal computer. And if it still doesn't work, then you need to go to the Illuminate software, which is the window you're watching the Pavinar in. If you go to Tools, Audio, Audio Setup Wizards, and follow the instructions, that may help too. Uh, beyond that, um, it's sometimes difficult to trouble shoot uh, individual problems, but those two solutions seem to do the trick for most of them. And if you have a question, um, I have muted all your microphones, and that is simply to decrease potential background noise. So I ask if you have a question, please raise your electronic hand. If you look on the left side of your screen, there's a list of participants with my name on top, and then everyone's below that. And there's a little hand with a green arrow. And if you click on that hand with a green arrow, essentially that raises an electronic hand. And that will alert me that you have a question. And then I ask that you type your question into the chat box after raising your hand. So if I see a hand, I know that um, you are in the middle of typing. And then once you type the question, I'll be able to address the, the question to the group. And as I mentioned, after the presentation, I will be emailing out PDH hours. If uh, you did not log into the website, please do respond to my email. So I, uh, I know I have some of your email addresses anyway, but uh, please do respond to the email, and I will be able to get a professional development hour to you. So today, we're going to do a broad introduction to Portland Cement Concrete Mixed Design. Now, this is our uh, second semester of the Pavinar series. So I'm kind of going through some of the, the more general background topics, such as uh, mixed design and broad concepts. But um, I do encourage you, if you have a topic of particular interest, you can email me directly uh, with that topic or go through the website when it gets back up. And um, these, this uh, Pavinar series is for you, the users. So if you have a topic of interest, please let me know, and we will fold it in. And today we will be talking about a, a basic introduction to Portland Cement Concrete Mix Design. So for the background, we'll go over the uh, base components of Portland Cement Concrete, and then some of the different mix design methods. And uh, there may be people on this Pavinar that know a little bit more than I do about some of these things. So uh, not only if you have questions, but if you also feel like you can add something to the, the discussion, please feel free to raise your hand and type something into the chat box. Because um, you know I put this information together based on my, my knowledge and my background. But there are certainly others out there with more specific knowledge that could add to the discussion and the learning of the group. The, uh, the mix design we'll focus on today is centered around the absolute vo volume method. And both the American Concrete Institute and the Portland Cement Association have uh, techniques in uh, dealing with this uh, absolute volume method. Then we will go through a, a quick mix design example that's based off the American Concrete Institute method. 
And then finally, I'll, I'll just point out some online resources uh, that have very, very nice material online, not only about mixed designs, but also about many other things that I encourage you to look at further. I'll provide links on, of these online resources. And I, it's, uh, I don't think you can access those links through Illuminate. However, I will be posting a PDF copy of this presentation on the website after uh, we finish today. So uh, you can go ahead and, and look at that and get those links as well. And I also want to note that uh, several of the tables in this presentation can be found directly at the Pavement Guide Interactive. Um, <coughs> that is an extremely nice website that we will uh, pull up the website address for later on. But they uh, go through a very nice example, and they have some nice tables that I uh, utilized for this presentation. So what are the components of Portland Cement Concrete? Well, first of all, you do have your aggregate, and that takes up the uh, majority of the Portland Cement Concrete structure. Also critical to Portland Cement Concrete is your water and some sort of cementitious materials. So the uh, water and the cementitious materials react together, and that forms the uh, strong strength that uh, concrete is known for. Uh, in addition, and a potential future topic, could be all on simply admixtures and fibers, either together or separately. There are uh, an incredible amount of, there's an incredible amount of information out there about both admixtures and fibers. And what we'll be going over today is really kind of Portland cement concrete basic. So just the very bare minimums, but there are uh, extremely large number of admixtures and fibers out there that can really enhance your mix. So that's a potential topic for the future. Uh, as I said, aggregates do take up the majority of the Portland cement concrete, uh, about 60 to 75 percent of the volume, and about 70 to 85 percent by mass. And those numbers vary based on your mix design and your local materials, uh, what you're looking for, those type of things. And the important characteristics for the aggregate is you want a high resistance to abrasion and degradation. You also want them to be resistant to the effect of freeze-thaw, especially when we're looking at pavements. Obviously, pavements are sitting outside. And um, you know, at, at night, when it gets cold, they will go through some freeze-thaw cycles. And you want to make sure your aggregates are resistant to doing that. Other important characteristics uh, include the alkali reactivity. That's a, a significant problem. In fact, here just south of Fayetteville on 540, there's some alkali reactivity issues going on. And um, one of our, our professors in, who works with concrete and structures, he's going to be doing a project with the highway department trying to really figure out what's going on with that aggregate and how can we um, find some solutions for that. Other important characteristics include particle shape, surface texture. These are uh, both important when you're uh, mixing the concrete, the workability of the concrete, and placing it. You want to make sure that the particle shape is not resisting good placement, and um, you're not getting a whole lot of air bubble. Well, you don't want trapped air in your Portland cement concrete. Uh, so those are two important characteristics. Degrading is also known as the gradation, or the size of the aggregates. There's uh, several different gradation bands that you can use depending on what kind of characteristics you're looking for. The density of the aggregate is important. The uncompacted void content has to do with how aggregates stack on themselves. Uh, so the, that's just a, a quantification of the macro texture or the particle shape of the uh, aggregate is the uncompacted void content. And then, of course, the absorption is critical. Since we're using water here in the Portland cement concrete, you want to make sure that your aggregate, um, well, you understand the absorption characteristics of the aggregate. If it absorbs a lot of water, that means that you will need to add a little bit more water to your mix design, whereas if it doesn't absorb much water, then uh, you don't want to add too much. And then finally, of course, the strength. The uh, Portland cement concrete, you want to have this strong aggregate because that does carry some of the load along with the uh, cement or the cementitious materials around the aggregate. But you want to make sure that you don't have pockets of weakness with those weak aggregates. So that's just a, a real broad overview of aggregate characteristics of the asphalt. 
or of the uh, Portland cement concrete, excuse me. Um, also important is the water, as mentioned. The water and the aggregates are really very critical. And uh, according to the uh, uh, Portland Cement Association, any potable water can be used uh, to make concrete. So if it's potable, that implies that it is treated. So um, you can use any sort of potable water in order to use your concrete, in order to make your concrete. You do uh, need to pay special attention to a couple of things, so your chloride levels, your sulfate levels, alkalis, and salts. These are characteristics of the water that can either inhibit the strength gain in the cement gel and in the cement matrix, or can also cause um, you know, other sorts of problems. So as you're evaluating your water source, any potable water can be used, but you do want to make sure that uh, those levels are adequate. And you can use salt water for those of you living on the coast, but you want extremely low levels of salt, and there can be no steel in the structure being constructed. So you can use salt water with CRCP or um, any pavement with the metal dowel bars. So that is an important consideration. So in addition to the aggregates and the water, as I mentioned, you can use admixtures. And um, this is just two bullet points that we'll go over here in this presentation. But there's a lot of information out there about admixtures. Uh, you have uh, accelerators and retarders. The accelerators make the concrete set more quickly. It builds that strength faster. The retarders do the exact opposite. It, it prevents that strength gain. And depending on your application, it prevents the short-term strength gain. Uh, you will get the long-term strength gain. But depending on the application, you may not want that strength gain uh, right off the bat initially. You can use air trainers. Those have many applications, one of which is to increase the durability of your uh, Portland cement concrete. You can use water-reducing admixtures. So if uh, there's a need to either uh, lower the water content or something along those lines, you can have admixtures that, that do that. Plasticizers can increase the flowability if you're going into small spaces or um, if you need to pump over long distances. Uh, plasticizers are something that can help. And these are just kind of the, the big five. As I said, there are many, many different kinds of admixtures, but really controlling the rate of the set of the concrete with the accelerators and the retarders, looking at the durability, looking at your working content, and then looking at your flowability. Those are kind of the big ones. Uh, but there are many other ones. And the point at the end of day uh, if, of the use of admixtures is first to reduce costs, also to achieve certain properties more effectively. So if you want a certain set time or if you want a certain type of uh, pumping characteristics, those can be done using admixtures. And then also maintaining quality through the production and the construction. So um, if you have a long haul distance or if uh, you know, you're making several different mixes in the same plant or something, these are all things where admixtures could come into play and help you out. And then also to overcome emergencies. If you make your mix, if you take it out to the job and it doesn't pass as it should be, sometimes the easiest solution is to add an admixture. So there's a lot of different uh, ways it can be used. Uh, the fourth component that we'll cover of a Portland cement concrete is the cementitious materials. The most common type is the Portland cement. And there's five types of Portland cement, depending on uh, what you need. And you can also have blends of those five types. Uh, just like the admixtures, Portland cement, that could be an entire presentation. It's just talking about the details of Portland cement. So um, that's all I'm going to say here. But again, if you're interested in hearing more about that, that's definitely a potential topic for a future pavenar. Uh, now, especially with the reuse of materials, trying to find new innovative methods of using materials, uh, fly ash has been very commonly accepted in Portland cement mixtures, and it is cementitious, so it does provide some of that strength and some of that bonding. Um, slag, silica fume, and other natural pozzolans. I think this list will only get larger as we continue to find new and innovative materials new and innovative techniques, I think that we will become more efficient with our cementitious materials and hopefully continue reducing the costs while either maintaining or hopefully increasing the quality of our uh, mixtures. And then finally, uh, fibers. There's many different types of fibers, steel,
plastic, glass, and other natural material have been used. There's round, flat, excuse me, round, flat, crimped, and deformed, and they're anywhere from a uh, half a quarter inch to six inches long, and they're anywhere from two ten thousandths of an inch thick to about three hundredths of an inch thick. So again, very wide variety depending on your needs. Um, they do help increase your tensile and flexural strength. Concrete is not as strong in tension as it is in compression. If you need a little extra tensile strength, fibers can help with that. And it's also good for, for thin layers. So when you're thinking about like white topping or um, you know, ultra thin overlays, fibers are definitely something that is interesting and we should look into more. And in fact, in uh, not next month, but the month after that, that would be April, there'll be an ultra thin white topping overlay pavenar. So I encourage you to, uh, to tune in for that if you're interested more in learning about these thin layers and then how maybe fibers can help with that, because we will certainly be covering that. So we went over the, the basic material properties that, that we're interested in. But when you take a step back and you think about, well, what are the characteristics of a mixed design? Really, what we're doing is we're trying to identify your fresh concrete properties. So the mixed design, you obviously want to design for the mechanical properties of the set concrete, for your strength and your durability, regardless of the application. But it's also a big concern to make sure that your fresh concrete properties are what you're looking for. Going back again to the haul distance or the pumping distance um, on site, um, or if you're going through a slip form paver, you know, these are different things that you need to take into account for. And the utilizing things in the mix design can kind of help along those lines. Um, finally, also you can have the inclusion, exclusion, or your limits on ingredients. And the ingredients of those five materials we just went over, the aggregates, the water, the cementitious material, admixtures, and then the fibers. Maybe there's a specifications that say you can or cannot have one of those. Maybe there are uh, specifications about the limits of some of those. So these are all important things to think about when you're uh, looking at your mix design. And at the end of the day, a properly proportioned concrete mix should provide acceptable workability of the fresh mix concrete, again, for the hauling and the pumping. Uh, the long-term strength or long-term characteristics you're looking for is durability, strength, and uniform appearance. It's uh, it's amazing how much aesthetics do count. But if something doesn't look good, people, no matter how strong it is, no matter how well uh, built it is, if it doesn't look good, that really does uh, not give off a good image of the quality of the material, regardless of its functionality. And then finally, also economy, especially um, now with material costs going up. This is something that we all need to be on the lookout for, is seeing, well, where can we potentially utilize new or different resources, new or different technologies, in order to get a better economy out of your mix. So the, the two different mix design methods that I was able to find are the absolute volume method and then the water cement method. And um, I'm sure there's more out there, but these are the two most popular ones that I was able to, to come up with. And the absolute volume method, we have uh, techniques from both the Portland Cement, Co Portland Cement Association and also the American Concrete Institute. You can find that under ACI 20 or 211.1 is the absolute volume mix design method for the, the concrete. Whereas the uh, water cement method um, is just offered by the Portland Cement Association. Now, what are the differences between these two methods? The principle behind the absolute volume method is designing around uh, either one cubic yard, one cubic foot, one cubic me meter. The uh, units do not matter. But at the end of the day, the total volume of your mix is what matters. And you'll see as we go through an example later on, um, one of the components is found by literally subtracting all the other materials from one. And you're able to do that through the fact that you're starting with either one cubic yard, one cubic millimeter, or one cubic foot, depending on what you're using. Whereas the water cement method, you actually need to go through some trial batches in order to um, 
to get the mix design you're looking for. And since the absolute volume method is the most common method in the United States, that is what we're going to focus on for this presentation. So that's kind of a very broad overview of um, you know Portland cement concrete, the characteristics, the whys and the hows of mixed design. And now we're going to go through um, the steps of the absolute volume method. But if you have any questions, I encourage you to raise your electronic hand, which is found on the left side of your screen under the list of participants. And if you raise your hand, then um, please go ahead and type the question in into the chat box below. Since there are no questions, we'll continue on. And again, if you do have questions while I'm talking, feel free to raise a hand as well. We don't need to wait. I just wanted to provide time for people to reflect a little bit. So the absolute volume mix design method, the, um, what I'm going to go off of is the one cubic yard. If you're on the other side of the pond, you'd probably be going off one cubic meter. Um, at the end of the day, you'll get the same answer. You'll get proportions of each material. But they have eight methods that you go through. And we're going to go through each one of these, from the slump to the maximum aggregate size, your water and air content, water cement ratio, cement content, and then your coarse and fine aggregate, and then finally your adjustments for the aggregate moisture. Now, at the end of doing this, you are able to perform uh, performance tests in the laboratory to verify strength and durability. So as I was reading through the literature, there I wouldn't say there's discrepancies, but there definitely are uh, different definitions of mixed design. Some are just getting the materials lined up in the quantity of materials, some of the materials plus the performance tests. So um, there's kind of a couple different ways to look at it. But at the end of the day, we are looking for a high quality performing uh, mix, which you'll need to run some performance tests on at some point. So the first thing we need to do is we need to choose our slump. And the slump indicates the workability, which is important for mixing, placing, uh, compacting if necessary, and then your finishing. And you can see here from ACI, they have a type of construction table. So depending on what application you're doing, whether it's foundation walls, footings, beams, columns, pavements and slabs, or massive concrete, they have different recommended levels of slump. And you can see that the pavements and the slab is the second to last line on that table. And their slump is a one to three inches is what you're looking for for your slump. And now, kind of honing in more on pavement applications only, the ACPA, which is the American Concrete Pavement Association, has come out with a fixed form versus slip form recommendations. So if you're using a fixed form for your paving application, you use the same slump range, one to three inches. But with a slip form, you can actually have a slightly lower slump. You can go down to zero inch slump. And that makes sense when you think about it, because with the slip form paver, um, you want the, the edges to stand on their own. So a slightly lower slump wouldn't be as much, as a pro much of a problem, just as long as you know you, you maintain the the um, high quality that you're looking for in the mixtures. So once you have the slump, you move on to the maximum aggregate size. And there's two things that we need to think about using the maximum aggregate size. The first is that you don't want your aggregates larger than one third of the slab, deck, the slab depth. So if you have, for example, a three inch slab, then you don't want any aggregates being larger than one inch. And the reason is, is you don't want aggregates to stack on top of each other. And if your aggregates are so large, you could have the possibility of two literally stacking on top of each other, taking up the entire slab depth or close to the slab depth. And that could um, provide a weak point in your structure. And also, if you're doing, say, CRCP, which is this picture here, uh, you want to have 3 quarters of a minimum clear space between the reinforcing bars. So if you have you know, for example, two inches uh, in between the reinforcing bars, then you would want to have at least oh, 
it's never a good idea to try and do uh, <laughs> math in your head. You would want to have at least uh, an inch and a half of clear space in between that two inches, which means your maximum size would only be a half an inch. So um, that's that's relatively small, but two inch spacing is a little on the small side too. So, but those are the two things that you want to look at: the third of an inch of, or a third of slab depth, or three quarters of minimum clear space between the reinforcing bars. And that's so you're able to make sure that you get the concrete worked all the way around the reinforcement bars, and you're not having the aggregate stack up on the sides, preventing the concrete from being able to go underneath there and provide the the solid structure that you're looking for. And uh, overall, you want to avoid both the difficult consolidation, and that's the um, aggregate stacking, and also um, uh, the compacting, because if you aren't able to consolidate or compact the pavement well, then you could have air pockets. And although you know Portland cement concrete is designed to have small air uh, bubbles in it, air pockets are a significant problem. Here's a, a very large table with a lot of numbers on it, looking at the water and air content. So I'll break this down a little bit. If you look along the top of your table, you have different aggregate sizes going from um, just under a half inch or nine and a half millimeters to four inches or 100 millimeters. That's your um, nominal maximum aggregate size. And if you call the nominal maximum aggregate size is the uh, first sieve to retain 10% or more, it's one sieve smaller than that. So it's not your top size, but it's uh, one sieve or two sieves smaller than that top size. And you also have the choice of having either air entrained or non-air entrained mixtures. Uh, air entrainment is a type of admixture, and you can put that in in order to create more air, more smaller air bubbles, and that will allow you to um, have higher workability or longer workability. So based on whether you have air entrained or non-air entrained mixed, and then also what your slump is, then you can figure out how much water you have. And you can see in the middle of the uh, table, there's a number in the middle with a number in parentheses under that. And the number in the middle is in metric, and then the number in parentheses is in English units. And that's either kilograms per meter cubed or pounds per yard cubed of how much water you have. Uh, in addition, for the non-air entrained PCC, they have some levels of, uh, or they have a level of the typical entrapped air. So how much air will be trapped in the mix, and this is something that you plan for. But if you're using air entrained uh, admixtures, you can actually use different admixtures to determine how much air you want in there. So if you look at the very bottom of the table, you can have a mild, moderate, or severe exposure, and that's to the elements, and then they have recommended air contents built into there. And as we go through the example in a couple minutes, you'll see how we need to use those air contents in order to design our mixes. But here, looking at the water and the air content, we're basically looking for a quantity of water and air in our mix that we're looking for. The next step is to establish the water cement ratio. So if there is a relationship between the materials and the compressive strength value, that's really a win-win situation, because then you're able to say, well, based on our 28-day compressive strength, what kind of water cement ratio are we looking at? And um, this is kind of like a chicken and the egg. What comes first, your compressive strength or your water cement ratio? But you'll see that um, as we go through here, this is an iterative process. So you know, sometimes you do have the compressive strength, sometimes you may not. Or um, sometimes you have a target compressive strength, and then you need to uh, choose your water cement ratio and see if that will get what you anticipate it to be. But you can see as you increase your compressive strength, so the very bottom of this table is the lowest compressive strength, and then each square, you're increasing the compressive strength. As you increase the compressive strength, you are decreasing the water cement ratio. And then they have both the non-air entrained and your air entrained option here on the left and the right. So we already have the amount of water you're putting in. We saw that on slide 14. And if the water content is known, 
and the water cement ratio is known, the cement content can be easily calculated. So once you know the water and the water cement ratio, you can simply find the cement content. So we now have the um, water content. We have the cement content. Now we're looking at the aggregates. And we'll start with the coarse aggregate. So when you're running your test, you have a number called the fine aggregate fineness modulus. And that's basically, that's related heavily to the gradation of your mix. And as we go through the example, you'll see the equation that's used for that gradation. But depending on your um, fine aggregate fineness modulus, they have a range from 2.4 to 3. And depending on your nominal maximum aggregate size, you can find out the percentage of your coarse aggregate content, or um, the, how much coarse aggregate you need. So for the smaller sizes, the, uh, with the low fineness modulus and the smaller nominal maximum aggregate size, we have a value of 0.5 for our coarse aggregate content. And then as you increase your nominal maximum size, the um, value of coarse aggregate content increases all the way up to almost 3 quarters. And then as the fineness modulus increases, it goes down a little bit. So the lower left-hand corner, low fine aggregate fineness modulus, large nominal maximum aggregate size, that gives you the highest uh, coarse aggregate content, whereas the smaller nominal maximum aggregate size and the larger fineness modulus gives you the um, lowest coarse aggregate content. And you'll see on the note here that you can increase these values of coarse aggregate content up to 10% for pavement applications. So um, if uh, you know, you talk with your agencies. This is an option in order to say we want a little extra coarse aggregate because it's a payment application. And this is something that you know comes with working with your state agencies, with your local contractors, and knowing a little bit about your material. But there's a special um, application, or there's a special note saying that you can increase it for payment applications. And another uh, important thing to notice is these volumes are based on the oven dry rotted weights. So we've talked a little bit about using water in our concrete, obviously. Well, the water that's in the aggregates can really um, influence your mix design. But for the case of this, for this coarse aggregate content, all of these volumes listed are based on the oven dry rotted weights. And here is an uh, example of the fineness modulus. The fineness modulus is simply calculated by adding together the cumulative percent retained on standard sieves. So if you get your standard sieve stack, sieve stack for aggregates, and you just simply sum the cumulative percentage retained on each one and then divide it by 100, that gives you the fineness modulus. So, so far we have the um, uh, water content, we have the cement content, we have the coarse aggregate content, we have the air content, and because we know all this and because we're using the absolute volume method, we can simply subtract those volumes from one, whether you're using one cubic meter, one cubic yard, one cubic foot. If you're basing it all on the absolute volume method, that means that you have a one. So you take your one and you subtract your volume of water, your volume of air, your volume of Portland cement or other cementitious materials, and your volume of coarse aggregate, and that gives you the volume of fine aggregate. Now the last step is to adjust for moisture. Um, like when I work a lot in the laboratory and our stockpiles are relatively small and they're usually in a climate controlled area, which means that they could dry out a little more, especially during these winter months when the heat's on more often, those aggregates will dry out a little bit. So uh, we actually track our aggregate moisture on a whiteboard. So when people are doing concrete mix designs, you can say, oh, well, this is the current moisture level of the aggregates. Because if an aggregate is bone dry, which is one extreme example, if it's been oven dry, it will certainly absorb some water. And if you don't account for that water absorption, you'll lower your water cement ratio, and you'll also reduce your workability. 
Now, on the other end of the spectrum, if you've got a stockpile that's sitting outside, we also have some stockpiles sitting outside, we get a big rainstorm, then your aggregate moisture will go up. And if your aggregate moisture goes up, you will contribute extra water to the paste. So the cement and water, as it mixes together, we call that a paste. And this is, and the fine aggregate, we call that the paste. This is something that if the aggregates are too wet, you'll end up increasing your water cement ratio, which will increase your workability, but it will also decrease your strength. So the, the take home lesson here is that your stockpile moisture content, whether you're in your lab or whether you're in the field, it's essential to know what your stockpile moisture content is when you're doing your mix designs. So once you uh, estimate all of your proportion, you make a trial batch and you check your slump and strength. And if you don't match, if you don't hit what you're looking for, then this is an iterative process. You'll need to go back, you'll kind of have to reevaluate what was working and what wasn't working and go from there. So this is an iterative process. So we've gone through the background. Uh, we went through the principles of the absolute volume method. And now we're going to go over a quick example for PCC mix design. But if there are any questions, I will take them now. OK. So for our quick example, now if uh, you can ask any of my students, especially last year in transportation engineering, it was an introductory course, absolutely loved it. But I, abs I love talking about um, pavements. So um, I'm going to do a quick example for the O'Hare International Airport. I got my PhD up at the University of Illinois, so we actually did quite a bit of work with O'Hare, working with their materials and their mix designs. So we're going to go through an example from uh, one of those mix designs uh, for up at O'Hare. So the first thing we need to do is assemble our knowns. So this is a pavement or slab. So our choice of slump will be one to three inches. And that's the first step. We saw, we've seen this table. And uh, as you go through the process, um, you'll be referencing this table depending on whether it's a pavement or a different type of construction. So one to three inch slump. And next, we need to figure out our nominal maximum aggregate size. Well, the aggregate uh, supplier up in the Chicago area the stockpile that we're needing to use has a nominal maximum aggregate size of one and a half inches. So that was determined for us. Now we decided to use air entrainment. And if you look at the table, you can see that we're looking at one and a half inch nominal maximum size. And then you go down to the first level, because our slump is one to two. You could also use three to four. Um, but I'm using one to two because um, that's a little more conservative. But like I mentioned, this is an iterative process. So if you make the sample and your slump isn't what you want it to be, or if your strength is too high, that can be an indication that you probably need a little bit more water. So the 250 you see down there, the 250 pounds per cubic yard of water, that's kind of your starting point. And then your recommended air content as well, you're assuming a moderate exposure, which would use 4.5% air. And we got a question from uh, James. He says that the actual moisture content of the aggregate at the time of mixed production is not known at the time of mixed production. How is the adjustment made at the time of mixed production if it rains on the aggregate stockpiles the night before mixed production? Well, I think that is an excellent question. And there are probably some people who work out in the field that would um, be able to answer this more uh, efficiently than I would. So I'm going to give an answer. But if someone um, wants to chime in, I would encourage you to, uh, to put your answer in the pot as well. Um, so I, I agree with you. The actual moisture content on the day of production is not known. So if it does rain, say, the night before, um, some adjustments will have to be made. And I think that there's um, one thing that immediately crossed my mind is that I know some people have covered aggregate stockpiles. And I realize that that is not, um, not possible for all places. And it's also an, an increased cost. But by covering your stockpiles, you are able to neutralize the effect of rain a little bit. I think that something else that you could do, though, as well is um, I would assume over time, you want to track your 
stockpile level. So maybe like every day you can run an aggregate moisture level, and then you can compare that to the weather report. So if it rained the night before, then the next aggregate moisture level you run, you make a note of that, that it had rained. And I think that over the next following days, you'll see that moisture level slowly drop. And if it rains, it'll go back up again. Um, so maybe by tracking that over time, then you can make those kind of on-the-fly adjustments because historically, you know, your aggregate gains X percent of water after a rain, and then you'll be able to adjust for that. Those are two things off the top of my head that I can think of, but I encourage um, other people, if you have either a technique or a way of managing that, I definitely encourage you to raise your hand and then type something in to, to add to the discussion. So while people are thinking about that, um, I'll just go through the equation on the bottom. So if we're looking at one cubic yard of mix. You simply multiply that by 250 pounds per cubic yard. Then you divide that by uh, the unit weight of water, which is 62.4 pounds per cubic yard. And you find out that we need four cubic feet of water. And that's four cubic feet per cubic yard. Using the absolute volume method, the one cubic yard is essential. One cubic yard equals 27 cubic feet. So if we know we need four cubic feet of water, we're starting to um, figure out what all these components are. And then using 4.5% air, you multiply that again by one cubic yard, which is 27 cubic feet. And you find out we need 1.2 cubic feet of air. So we have now our water and our air. Now, James, did I uh, answer your question well enough? I know it was kind of a, um, it may not be everything you're looking for, but um, if you have a, a follow-up question, please feel free to, to type that in. <clears throat> so we have the water content and the air content. And now if we, um, know that we're either targeting 4,000 PSI or if it's a specification. Um, when you're looking at your specifications, if it's targeting a, a certain compressive strength or historical testing, there's many different ways to figure out that compressive strength. You can figure out your water cement ratio. We're using an air entrained mix. We're targeting 4,000 PSI. So our water cement ratio is 0.48. You take the amount of water you have, which is the 250 pounds per cubic yard. You divide that by 0.48, and you can determine how many cubic yards, pounds per cubic yard of cement that you'll use. And you take that 521, you multiply it by one cubic yard, and then divide it by the um, unit weight of cement. Uh, cement, Portland cement has a, a specific gravity of around 3.15. I think that's the number I used. 3.15 times 62.4 is 197. So 521 divided by 197, and we have 2.6 cubic feet of cement. Now that we have the water, the air, and the cement, the next thing we'll look at is the coarse aggregate content. So the fineness modulus, which was determined during the sieve analysis of this aggregate source that we used, we had a fineness modulus of 2.6. Our nominal maximum aggregate size was 1.5. So our coarse aggregate content is 0.73. Now that does not mean 73% of your mix is going to be coarse aggregate, or 73% of the structure. That means that. Um, what you do is you take that 0.73, you multiply that by the rotted unit weight, which is a material property, which is determined to be 98 pounds per cubic foot. And then you multiply that by the 27 feet cube, or the one cubic yard, since we're using the absolute value method. And you can figure out the weight of, your, um, of the coarse aggregate in one cubic yard, or 27 cubic feet. And with that weight, which in this example is 1,932 pounds, you simply divide that weight by the unit weight of um, the coarse aggregate. 
and you can get how many cubic feet of coarse aggregate you have in your mix. And I believe the, um, let's see, 165.4, I think I used 2.65, let's see, 165.4, uh, yeah, 2.65 was the um, specific gravity of the aggregate that was used in this example. But this is a number that you'll have. So if you know the specific gravity, you simply multiply that by the unit weight of water. And that's the density, which uh, we got to be 165.4. So in one cubic yard of concrete, we need 11.7 cubic feet, of course, aggregate. And now in order to find the um, fine aggregate content, you simply take that one cubic foot, or excuse me, one cubic yard, or 27 cubic feet, and you subtract your water, which was 4, and your air, which was 1.2, and your coarse aggregate, which is 11.7, and you have 10.1 cubic feet of fine aggregate. And then finally, our last step is to adjust for moisture levels. I did not do an example of that. Um, I apologize, but if your well, moisture levels are on the higher side, then you can decrease that from the amount of water you're putting in and so forth. It's a little more involved, that step, which is why I didn't put it in. But you do need to adjust for your aggregate moisture levels. And then finally, we got one more slide of uh, our online resources. So I encourage you to uh, look at the website for American Concrete Pavement Association, which is ACPA. And um, I'm not able to click on that link right now. But again, if you can either write it down or you can go to um, the PDF file that I'll upload at the end of this presentation later this afternoon, and uh, you can get the link from there. And there's also something called the Concrete Optimization Software Tool. This is something that was put together by the FHWA, the Federal Highway Administration. And it's a software tool that allows you to go through and start playing with some of those numbers. So James, you were talking about um, you know, these on-the-fly kind of estimates you use in order for moisture contents. The concrete optimization software tool is something that could kind of help you if all of a sudden your um, moisture level changes significantly. You can use something like that in order to uh, adjust. And then also, as I mentioned, the uh, pa Pavement Guide Interactive was something put together by the University of Washington. And it, this is just a really, really nice overview of um, the Portland cement concrete in general. And also, they have a nice section on the mixed design as well. So if you're uh, interested in learning a little bit more about that, you can find it at the training.ce.washington.edu. So all of these do have good information on PCC mix designs, along with good additional information on related topics. So just kind of in general, these are nice resources. So in summary, I'm uh, going to try what I did at the, the last PAVENAR uh, last year. I'm going to actually go through uh, a summary slide but before opening up for questions. Oh, here we go, question. So uh, James had a question, is it possible to do multiple mix designs at different, at different aggregate moisture contents in order to anticipate changes in aggregate moisture contents at the time of mix production? And I think absolutely. I think that is a, a, an excellent way to ensure that you're accounting for some of that variability. Um, so kind of going back, I was talking about tracking the um, asphalt or the aggregate moisture level, um, especially if you're in a warmer climate. I'm not sure uh, where you are, James, but if you like, if here in uh, in um, Arkansas, you know, it's it's above freezing for a lot of the winter. So when the production slows down a little bit during winter, this is something that's actually, I think, a very useful tour, tool because you have some extra hands on deck to do some of this work. But tracking that moisture content and then maybe doing a mixed design each day, I think that would be tremendously beneficial. Oh, okay. So you work all over the country. Yeah, so I'm originally from Wisconsin, so that you know you can't do a whole lot, especially with involved with water, um, you know, this time of year. They're all kind of hunkered down. But um, I, I think absolutely it'd be a good idea to uh, do mixed designs. 
And then uh, Brent, he is actually from the Asphalt Concrete Pavement Association, so I guarantee you he knows more about uh, concrete and concrete mix design than I do, but he's raised his hand, so he's typing in uh, some discussion as well. Thank you, Brent. Okay, so Brent's confirming that most producers do moisture content tests daily. Um, that's definitely helpful. Thank you, Brent. Um, so if, uh, I, I definitely encourage discussion. I think what I'll do is I'll quickly go over the logistics wrap up. And then I'll open the floor for more questions and discussions. But um, you know, I appreciate you guys um, being flexible here with the um, with the the pavement our site being down. That, that's pretty frustrating. Um, but that's one of the joys of technology. But if I, I have several of you were able to log on through the website, if you were able to log on through the website, I have your email. If you were not able to log on through the website. I may or may not have your email, but if you use the link, please just go ahead and respond to the email saying um, paving our website down just to, to ensure that I have your email because I don't want you guys to get shorted for your PDHs, and then I'll have your email address. But if you logged on through the website, you should be okay. Uh, you can rewatch the Pavinars through the website, so um, once it gets back up, and uh, I can download that. You can look at some of those links. And also, please, please, if you have topic suggestions, uh, James, you had a lot of uh, thanks, James. You had a lot of good questions about aggregate moisture content and those type of things. I'm sure there's other people out there with those same questions. So, if these are topics that are interesting to you, uh, please do feel free to suggest them because um, you know that. That's th these presentations are for you guys, and I really enjoy putting them together. Um, I learn a lot when I review some of these topics that I'm not as close to, and I know that a lot of you have a lot of knowledge. You know, guys like Brent have a lot of knowledge, and you can also add to these discussions. So I think it's kind of a win-win for everyone. And finally, the next webinar will be uh, Tuesday, March 6th, and I'm I play with fire, looking at both Portland cement, concrete, and hot mix asphalt. Uh, but I think they're both very good products for paving, and I don't think one is better than the other. I think some have better applications, but I'm trying to kind of give each one equal playing time. So next month, March 6th, I'll be talking about HMA mix design. So with that, um, thank you all for your participation. We went over a background, the absolute value method with an example, and then you saw some resources. But if you want to continue questions, please hang around, and I appreciate you joining me. Thank you very much.